Welcome everyone to CG seminar webinar number 303, 3, 000, uh, 303, uh, a big number. And today's topic is micro credentials, new phase and face of higher education, question mark. Important development micro credentials in many countries. And to tell us about them today, we have John Brennan and Harkin Ergin. I'll introduce them in a moment. Let me take you through the webinar protocols first. Now, remember that we're being recorded uh, and you'll be able to access the webinar, the whole proceedings on our, um, our own CSHE website. And that takes you to our YouTube channel that should be available to you within the next day or so. You'll also be able to access the chat, the public chat function from today on our website. Now, during the webinar, Please keep yourself muted. Extraneous noise can interrupt the, the speakers. Uh, and there's no need to uh, have your camera on either. But when we get to the Q&A section and we want to bring you into the discussion, uh, of course, those protocols change and you turn on your mic and you turn on your video. We recommend that you use speaker view during the webinar um, so you can more clearly see who is talking. Now, to ask a question or to make a statement as part of the Q&A section of the webinar, please post your comment or your question in the chat first, and I'll select participants into the webinar discussion on the basis of what comes forward in the chat. So it's a good idea to post your comment, your question fairly early, soon after the speakers have finished, because if you come in late, you, you could miss out altogether. Uh, when you're invited into the um, Q&A, and I'll send you a little warning in the um, chat first, when you're invited into the, into the Q&A, turn on your, uh, your mic, most important, um, turn on your camera if you can, and then tell us who you are and where you are from. Okay, at this point, it's a great pleasure to introduce our speakers. John Brennan, you'll remember from two webinars ago, He's an honorary research fellow at Oxford University and an emeritus professor at the UK Open University, where he directed the Centre for Higher Education Research and Information. He's a sociologist. He has many contributions to policy, to policy-related papers for UK and international organisations. Um, Harkin Ergen has a doctoral degree from Bogadici, Bogadici. Yeah, uh, university. As an international graduate student, he previously studied, studied at the State University of New York and Wurzburg University in Germany. He recently worked at the Boston College Center for International Higher Education as a postdoctoral scholar. And we, have, of course, many links uh, with the, um, with the, the CIHE at, uh, at Boston. His interests include the internationalization of higher education, digitalization, refugees in higher education, the right to higher learning, quality in higher education, and brain drain. He teaches at several countries, but I think from here on, the two speakers can introduce themselves best, and I'll pass first to John Brennan. John. Hello. Um, Harkin and I have been working together um, on the British Council project on micro-credentials, um, comparing um, the developments um, in the UK um, with the more planned developments um, in, 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 in Turkey. Um, however, as Simon already indicated, micro-credentials seem to be everywhere. Um, and so we want, so what I will do in, in my session, um, I'll say a few things about the UK, uh, what's happening in the UK, with micro-credentials, um, but I will also draw on some of the broader um, literature on um, micro-credentials, um, and then Harkin will come in with a more focused case study of what's happening and is going to be happening um, in Turkey. Um, so, in many ways, I think, um, you know, I'm going to be... Um, asking quite a lot of questions, um, but not really answering all that many of them. 
Um, the first two on the screen in front of you there, are micro-credentials something new and are they something important? So let's have the next slide and try to um, answer those, um, please. Um, the first is a, is a quotation um, from a recent um, publication um, by the UK um, Quality Assurance Agency. Micro-credentials can be said to have been around for a while with a new name. Um, higher education um, has a long history of running short courses, some with credit, some without credit, and for different audiences. And certainly, if one looks at the UK um, micro-credentials, in some cases, um, it's a new name that has been applied to something that has been going on for many, many years. So it's not new at all. But alongside that, I think there is a lot of innovation and a lot of new development. We'll come on to those for in a moment. Well, are they important? Um, I'm not sure. Um, and again, looking at the OECD, explosion of micro-credentials um, across higher education systems in recent years, sometimes independently, um, sometimes linked between higher education institutions and other, organ and other organizations. And indeed, that's um, another um, question that we need to be considering, is the extent to which micro-credentials are part of higher education, or are we existing alongside higher education, or are part of linkages um, between different, different organizations? So my first main question then is, what are they micro-credentials? So let's have the next slide, please. Here's um, a definition um, from UNESCO. Um, four elements, focused learning achievement, verifying what the learner knows, understands, or can do. The assessment is based on clearly defined standards awarded by a trusted provider. Stand has standalone value, but may also contribute or combine with other micro-credentials or even macro-credentials um, and including the recognition of prior earning and then also meeting standards required by relevant quality um, assurance bodies. I think the point of this definition is that it is very much a definition of the credential rather than the course or the learning that is leading to that um, credential. And um, this, this is, um, I think, uh, um, you know, a, a bit of a complication. But let's move on to the next slide. Um, and the point, again, coming back to the point that I was making really earlier about um, higher education linking with other organizations, private and professional bodies, commercial entities. Um, community organizations, many other types of organizations. So again, a question of are micro-credentials part of higher education, existing alongside edu higher education, or maybe are they an alternative to higher education? May they even be competitive with um, some other forms of um, higher education? Now, I'm not sure that I can answer all of these questions. And indeed, it's, it's quite likely that one would give different answers to these questions in different countries um, and in different contexts. Let's move on to the next slide. Still on points of um, definition. Um, and the first point to make is that the terminology um, we're talking about micro-credentials. Um, the British government in a recent report about lifelong learning, life, um, which was an Im Im important policy document, um, it never actually mentioned micro-credentials at all. But there was a lot of modules. Um, and it does seem to me that one of, one of the difficulties with micro-credentials you know, is, is when they're used and when they're not used. 
in, and microcredentials are short courses, but many short courses are not called microcredentials. Similarly with modules, digital badges, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So coming back to a definitional point, quality assurance agency again emphasised it's a credit bearing against a recognised level. It is subject to standard quality assurance mechanisms, although there are questions there about who is providing them. And while it carries no upper or lower limits on the amount um, of credits that the microcredential carries, um, it should not normally um, be considered as a war an award in its own right in the qualifications framework. That I think is an important and interesting comment specific to the UK system. So that a micro-credential is, is, is something that you've done and it might contribute credits to a recognized qualification, which might be a certificate, it might be a diploma, it might even be a degree. And you can stack lots of micro-credentials to get a degree, um, although that may be difficult to do. Um, but it's not, according to the formal um, British context, um, a qualification in its in its own right. So lots of questions. Let's move on to the next slide, which is partly about um, who answers the questions, who makes the decisions. Do we have national systems, and what's the role of governments? What's the role of national quality assurance agencies? Um, there may be other entities. There are then the providers of micro credentials but those, um, the awarders of the credentials, and then the learners taking them. Um, again, um, in the UK context, um, micro-credentials, I think, sit quite well within the quite marketized system of um, shifting a lot of decision-making to the learners themselves, who can select their education um, by choosing their micro-credentials. Um, but within all of this, there's a questions of balancing diversity, um, which is what micro-credentials, I think, are providing. Um, but when you get to the stacking and combining of, micro, of different micro-credentials, um, balancing the diversity with the quality, balancing innovation with good standards, and also maintaining academic values. Moving on then to what do learners, government, employers, and societies want? If we could take the next slide, which is looking at the providers, um, and just a list there, they can be universities, they can be other education providers, they might be industry bodies, um, then there are organizations like the British Council, um, the, the, uh, the World Bank, Google, and others. Um, but also, there can be quite a lot of collaboration uh, um, between um, different um, providers and organizations. And just giving, a, um, looking at some examples from the UK system, next slide, please, um, as examples of this. So just for, um, I should mention here um, FutureLearn, um, which some of you, um, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, um, which is um, a body which was originally set up by the Open University, um, but is now a network of, I think, about 130 universities around the world. Um, and many of them are contributing um, micro-credentials or other courses. Um, FutureLearn is currently providing 52 micro-credentials. I've only given you four here, um, and, um, but you know, it, it's, a, it's an interesting website that I would recommend to you. But just looking at the four here, climate change, Open University with the Cisco Networking Academy, data science, Glasgow University, with the Institute of Leadership and Management. Managing people is Reading University and the Henley Business School. Um, and no university at all for leadership of veterinary professionals, um, where 
with a mixture of the National Health Service leadership and the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons. So Future Learn um, in, um, describes their credentials as being designed to upskill you for work um, in the growing industries, um, but without the time and cost of having to do a full degree. They can be used as an independent certificate and some even offer credit to use as a degree. So again, the interesting thing there is that it's it, on this perspective, it's about learning, not necessarily about the certification of learning. And there is always the question of, is the learner studying because they want the knowledge and the skills, or are they doing it more because they want the qualification? Next slide, please. Um, a few more examples from the UK system. The Open University um, last year, at any rate, I've not got the up-to-date information, but 4,117 4, students were studying for micro-credentials, all online. Um, 2,614 were postgraduate micro-credentials, um, 1,503 undergraduate. Um, throughout, people throughout their lives, age quite evenly spread. But an important point here is that most of them were already graduates. 30% 30, 30 were already postgraduates. So it was not, in a sense, a, an alternative to higher education. It was for people who already had higher education. Um, and so um, the issue really of our micro-credentials, if we take it into the social equity issues, is it um, providing a higher education experience for people who have not been fortunate enough to have it? Um, on these figures, it's implying that that's not the case that it's actually giving more higher education to people who already have higher education. However, that's just one example. Let's get another example with the next slide. Um, Coventry University. Coventry University you know, provides micro-credentials um, itself, but it does a lot of them working with businesses. Some quotes from um, people I interviewed at Coventry um, about they're working with businesses, um, which is what a lot of um, Coventry University is about. It's about the skills, just showing, um, and, and it's not just about participating. Um, a lot of the students are doing it because their boss told them to do it. And the badge is a certificate of completion, not necessarily a proof of achieving anything. Rather cynical comments there, you may think. Um, and also, the businesses may not be particularly interested in the micro-credentials. Um, it's about learning, not necessarily about credit. Now, Coventry does, a, does offer micro-credentials itself, independently of businesses. Um, but then there's a lot of work with businesses, but that is actually quite different. So again, I think, again, the question of what are micro-credentials? There may be different things in different contexts. Moving on then, please, to um, what the learners of micro-credentials are requiring. And some simple answers here. Um, qualification, new knowledge, skills, confidence, all of the above, or some of the above. Um, and in many respects, um, the, this takes us to you know, another question, and, and I'm nearing the end of my questions now, of what's the use of micro-credentials? So let's, let's move on. Um, before we move on to that, um, um, let's move on to the question of who awards the micro-credentials. Next slide, yeah. Um, and again, several answers. In many cases, it is the provider of the course, 
the Open University is providing micro credentials to the students who take them, so does Coventry. But for the other, a lot of the other organisations, um, they are linked to an awarding body. Um, and, and indeed, that's one of the things that Coventry um, is, um, is, is doing, is that in some of its partnerships with businesses, um, the, the businesses basically provide the micro-credential, um, but Coventry provides the, um, the, the certificate to go with it, or provides the, the credential to go with it. Um, questions, though, then, if one, if students are acquiring stacks of micro-credentials from different places, um, and the notion that these can build up to um, acquire a degree or a diploma, um, who is going to award the degree or the, or the diploma? And I think this is one of the big quality assurance issues um, a single micro-credential may be good and may have received good quality assurance, but the, the stack of maybe 15 micro-credentials that an individual student has selected and chosen to take, what does that big stack um, am am amount to? Um, and then another question there about what do learners want or do they need, in fact, the qualifications? Um, for remember that an awful lot of them are already graduates or postgraduates. Um, are they studying micro credentials because they need the micro credential, or are they studying micro credentials because they need new knowledge and skills? So, moving on, I think, to my last question, which is what's the use of micro credentials? Well, returning now to OECD, um, which I think um, came up um, with a number of, of, of uses. They're being used to support newly unemployed workers to return swiftly to work. Um, and in so doing, it can help address structural policy challenges in education and in labor and labor markets. So it's now, you know, linked to employability, lifelong learning um, over the lifetime. At the other end, though, it can also be used to support the transition from upper secondary education into tertiary education. In other words, people acquire some micro credentials um, after um, leaving school. Um, and use the micro credentials um, to, 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 to enter higher education. Um, I have to say, I, I, I'm not sure that I've seen that much evidence for that, but in principle, that can be another use. Um, could be used to support the completion of degree programs um, and, and the, the, the issue of um, mixing degrees um, you, maybe you do a year of a degree and then two years of micro credentials. I think there, there, there are, um, or two years worth of micro credentials. There are mixes um, like that, which I think we can find across the system. Um, and um, the, 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 the next point, um, they can be integrated in diverse and flexible ways. Um, and I think that is something which, which, which is definitely the case, diversity and flexibility. Um, another slide, what will be their effects? Um, and the question of what will be the effects on their learners? What will be their effects on higher education? Will it be an integral part of it? Will it exist alongside it? Or might it even replace it? Um, I should have said, incidentally, um, that a lot of micro credentials are offered online by online, but not exclusively. And I don't think that is a necessarily a definition of it. But at the moment, I think um, a, a high proportion are um, provided online. Um, effects on the economy, on society, um, on change and innovation, more or less social equity greater conformity or greater diversity. I think these are important, interesting and important questions. 
I don't think we're able to answer them yet. Um, nearly finished with um, a, um, another slide, please. More from OECD. Um, micro credentials in the future. Well, um, OECD micro credentials can in increase the flexibility of education, the training and provision, and improve its alignment to labor markets. That all sounds good stuff. But at the same time, there is a risk that micro credential innovations will deepen existing inequalities in access to higher education and lifelong education. And the, 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 the predominance of graduates taking micro credentials in the UK system um, would seem to um, strengthen um, that, that, that point. But also, that learners lack information about micro credentials and, and, and offerings. And, and this, this, in a sense, limits how well they may use it. Um, and then the last one widespread recognition of micro credentials by academic institutions is not yet well established, limiting their portability and stackability. And if I just mention from our British Council project, one of the things I was finding in the work I did with UK universities was that a lot of the people I spoke to didn't really know what micro credentials were, you know, and these were people often in quite senior positions um, in um, British universities. Um, final slide. Um, what do we know? What do we actually know about micro credentials? Um, the OECD again, learners do not yet have trusted source of um, information that permits them to compare systematically the features of micro credentials by different higher education institutions and indeed other providers. So how do you choose, you know, from these hundreds, if not thousands of micro credentials around? And also from a um, QAA interview, um, evidence of success is scant. Many would agree that a better, that a greater investment in commitment to research is required to better understand the key barriers and enablers to successful micro credentials and implementation. I often think with, with research and profits, one can distinguish between the things we know and the things we don't know. I feel that with micro credentials at the present time, the things we don't know provides a, a longer list than the things that we do know. But it is, I think, nevertheless, a very important development. And we do need to start answering um, many of the questions that I feel are, are not yet being answered. I'm stopping there. Okay, I think you now have the floor. Yeah, thank you so much, Simon, uh, for having us and hosting this organization about this such a timely topic. Uh, and thank you so much, John. I think you gave a really good background information about uh, what micro credential is. Uh, and now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about maybe as a case study on micro credentials at a national level so i guess you see the screen i'm just sharing and okay by the way greetings from italy i am normally turkish originally but right now i'm at i'm at a project in italy so greetings from here near rome so we are doing a project right now with uh, John. Uh, it is sponsored by the British Council in Turkey. Uh, so we would like to thank them for uh, their support on this timely topic. 
Well, uh, there are some examples of micro-credentials in the United Kingdom. Of course, there are lots of questions about what they are and if they can be transferred from one institution to another and how we can uh, assure their quality. There are lots of questions, not just in the UK or Turkey, but also uh, in some other regions in the world. So we are going to have the answers of these questions maybe in time. So because it is an evolving issue in international higher education. So what we are doing in this project is, first of all, let me just uh, briefly present to you about a couple of examples of cases at some different levels all around the world. For example, there is microball project and uh, it is exploring if micro credentials can be implemented or uh, how uh, it can be implemented or how it's uh, impact uh, might be on higher education uh, in the Bologna higher education region. It might be an example to a, a regional project on micro-credentials. Also, there are some uh, studies maybe uh, in Australia. Uh, now, some universities already started to offer some uh, micro-credential programs for international students. So. In the future, I think right after this project, we are going to work on this with uh, John. But in the future, I think it will be also a, a good means for attracting more and more international students through online, blended, or in person. And also in Canada, for example, in North America, including the United States, which is also, I think, a hometown for micro credentials. Uh, they, are, they are really developed in the United States. In Canada, for example, even some small colleges right now are uh, focusing on how to spread uh, their uh, access to some communities, maybe some disadvantaged people or some international people around the world through micro credentials. So in our project, we focused on Turkey right now. Let me briefly just uh, give you some background information about Turkish higher education. It is a quite large system, including over 8 million students. Uh, it is the leading country in terms of uh, the number of students in the European higher education area. And uh, nearly, uh, we have almost 200,000 right now. It is over uh, 184,000 academics in the system and 208 universities. One in every three is private and the rest are public. Most of the students are registered in public universities over 91. So higher education is uh, mostly sponsored by the government and the public. So, and the governance of uh, Turkish higher education is quite centralized. Uh, the Council of Higher Education, uh, which includes 21 members, uh, and most of them are uh, appointed by the government, uh, the Minister of Education or other related bodies. Uh, the Council of Higher Education coordinates all the universities and higher education across Turkey. So it is a quite centralized system. Uh, maybe this background will uh, help us uh, better understand a little bit about uh, the micro-credential issue in Turkey. Of course, there are no officially called micro-credentials in Turkey. By the way, uh, maybe you know Turkey changed its name from Turkey recently, but it is, new even for us as Turkey. So sometimes maybe I can mix Turkey or Turkey, but in from now on in official papers, it is uh, written as Turkey. So sometimes maybe I mix them. So sorry for this, but officially the correct and newer one is Turkey. So uh, there are some short online and in-person courses, mostly provided by uh, universities, uh, open education or continuing education departments. And also, of course, uh, in today's world everywhere, I think there is the inflation of certificates. If you uh, walk on a street, you, you can see lots of courses, training centers, which provides lots of certificate educations. Uh, but as John said, micro-credentials is, I think, one of the questions is also about it. Maybe John will uh, give this an answer in the very end. When we say micro-credentials, we say uh, credential, provided by a trusted provider and whose quality is assured by an external agency or external institution. So 
uh, micro credentials is a little bit different from you know these certificate programs. So what we are doing in this project is so we are just trying to explore if micro credentials can be a potential credentialing system in Turkish higher education based on some experiences of the United Kingdom. We are getting some good examples in the United Kingdom. And in the light of these, we are just trying to explore if we can implement these in Turkey or not as well. Uh, I am gonna uh, present just some uh, field explorations on the Turkey side because we have not published this research yet. And uh, due to the time limitation, I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about our uh, explorations on the Turkey side. So on the Turkey side, uh, we either in person or through online surveys, we uh, spoke to almost uh, 300 people and 131 students from uh, various universities, departments, undergraduate students, all of them. Uh, we gave them an online survey and we asked them uh, we provided them with a brief information about micro-credentials and we also asked them if they would like to have some flexible learning pathways during their undergraduate education or not. We, uh, through this survey, we just uh, try to understand their perspective from the students' point of view. And also we interviewed 13 academics uh, each one of them are uh, head of departments from various social science, engineering, medical schools, et, et cetera, all around Turkey. And also we in person interviewed 21 directors of continuing education centers at universities, which already provide short courses. But these short courses are not officially recognized as micro-credentials. So, even if a student gets a, a certificate from these universities or maybe his or her own universities continuing education center, then uh, this certificate may not be recognized or counted as an elective course or something else at his or her university or somewhere else. So uh, we just also try to explore what they think as experienced short course providers at, in the higher education system. Uh, in Turkey. And also we interviewed five rectors, uh, the presidents of universities. And also we interviewed four policymakers at quite high level, including the members of uh, Council of Higher Education, uh, the uh, advisor to the president of Turkey and some other officials uh, at the Minister of Higher Education, Minister of Education, National Education, sorry. And also we interviewed three a private a short course providers. We chose the ones a, which have been doing, a, providing these short courses trainings a, for over 20 years in Turkey. So they have their a, own a, assurance, maybe system evaluation system. They are the a, ones who are doing a, this job and providing certificates. Uh, for the longest time in Turkey. So we just wanted to have some various perspectives about micro-credentials. And uh, we just pre uh, presented some information about micro-credentials to the students. They are not aware of what micro-credentials is. And also the other non-student participants are all aware of what micro-credentials are. So uh, we just wanted to take a diversity uh, diverse perspectives from uh, diverse uh, participant groups. So as I said, we had online surveys and in-person interviews. So, and uh, I will not make you bored with lots of statistics, uh, some uh, frequency tables, etc. but here I just wanna, because of the limit, limitation on time, I just wanna share with you the three most frequently found uh, themes in data analysis in the interviews and uh, open-ended survey notes. So it was quite surprising for us. For us, uh, so we spoke to almost 300 participants from various groups, and over 95% of them 
had some positive attitudes towards having micro credentials in Turkish higher education. And number one rational reason for this is flexibility. Students are not happy with typical undergraduate education, undergraduate curriculum. They would like to have some flexible pathways. Some students, for example, uh, get some courses like from platforms like edX or uh, maybe some other future learn. Uh, it is quite easy today through online uh, technologies uh, and they would like to use these credentials in their transcript. So they would like they say that they don't want to have uh, some elective courses which are offered by the university because they are quite limited. And also uh, the other participants also agree on it. And also if we have some academics perspective, they also agree that there must be some supplementary to univer university curricula because sometimes it might be quite far away from the uh, practical world or maybe uh, they might be old fashioned, but uh, with some micro credentials, which can be provided by the own university, other universities, or maybe another provider out of higher education might support university curricula as well. And of course, one of the maybe most important findings is that uh, they would like to have micro credentials because they are not satisfied with uh, the level of uh, skills they earn during undergraduate education. And because of the skill gaps, also we spoke to the participants from the private sector and also university governors, they also uh, have the same actually uh, statistics of their students' employability. And uh, also some research shows that there is a, a skill gap, skill mismatch between the uh, employers' uh, expectations and the newly graduates' uh, current uh, skills. So they think that if they get micro-credentials, then their employability will be increasing which is also a finding in uh, other countries' reports as well. Of course, everything is not perfect, as, especially integrating something into a nationally and centrally governed higher education system. So there are lots of concerns, challenges, uh, which are mentioned uh, in our data. I am gonna share the most frequently uh, given once again. So number one is who will provide micro-credentials? In the maybe North American case, we see that not only universities, but also other providers, maybe some private companies and maybe uh, some global companies, we already know some technology companies, and even we know some maybe fast food companies provide some micro-credentials. And these credentials can be used and recognized at uh, undergraduate level or master's level, and it can be counted as a course in students' transcripts. So the question is, who will do it in Turkey? One of the concerns is that because there are 208 universities, some of them provide uh, 100% in English, English medium uh, teaching, and some of them provide offer teaching in Turkish, and some of them are quite established universities at the age of maybe 500 years old, and some of them are quite new. So there is a perception in society, these universities are good and these are bad. So the participants say that, okay, we can do it, but who will provide these micro-credentials? Only the good universities will provide or all the universities will provide? Of course, we don't have an answer to this question. So as I said, it is evolving and time will show us. And another one is how to assess learning in micro-credentials. As I said before, there is an inflation of certificate trainings here in I think almost all around the world. And here in Turkey, we checked even the university's certificate programs, the same program is provided to same 
student provide prof same student groups uh, with the same profile maybe in one of the regions maybe uh, in Turkey for maybe three months, including maybe 180 hours of training, but the same certificate is given at just in a weekend of time at another university. So they have the same certificate and they can use the same certificate in their professional life. So who will uh, assess how their learning, their assess assessment is done? So uh, the problem is actually the participants' concern is that if micro credentials will be integrated into higher education, then there should be specifically determined some assessment criteria. And the other one is, of course, maybe the hot topic, not only about micro credentials and today in higher education uh, in general, how to assure quality of micro credentials. So if a university offers micro credentials, will there be an internal body which will assure micro, micro credentials quality or there should be another external body or there should be another international body which will observe and inspect the quality. So this is another concern. And of course, another hot topic, not only in Turkey, in our study, but also in Canada, one of the reports I, re I recently read, recognition and transferability of micro-credentials. As I said, there are over 200 universities and some of the universities are known or believe that they are good universities, but some others are not. So the participants' uh, concern is that, so does each university have to recognize another one's micro-credentials into their transcripts? So is there be a group like an Ivy League maybe, which in which universities should recognize the group of universities should recognize their own micro credentials and transfer transfer them between each other, or it should be implemented across the nation level. So this is another concern. But as I said, not just in Turkey, but everywhere. And another issue is uh, again a global issue actually. At what level of higher education we should integrate micro credentials into the system? At associate level, I mean community college level or vocational programs only, at bachelor's undergraduate level or postgraduate, I mean master's or doctoral level, at which level? There are already some programs all around the world right now, like micro masters different from non-thesis master's programs. Uh, these micro master programs include fewer classes, courses to take. And also in the very end, they give a micro credential with a certificate, which has a more specific uh, focus. For example, a non-thesis master's might be in business, but in business, a micro-credential may be, for example, in uh, environmental concerns in business. So in micro-credentials, in general, the focus is more specific. But as I said, the participants' concern is, so maybe because the commercial reasons, because it might be a good way of uh, maybe marketing these uh, shorter, maybe micro master programs to international students or other people uh, may be easier for, from universities. So it might be a good maybe source of income in the future. So the participants concern is uh, it should not be provided at the doctoral level or at master's level, they say. So this should be only at the undergraduate level. Otherwise, they think that the quality of postgraduate education might be negatively influenced. So as I said, we have a long road ahead. So the concept is evolving in Turkey and maybe all around the world, as I said, at different supranational 
regional, national, and maybe local levels. So maybe with John, we are uh, still focusing and working on our report, but maybe a couple of our recommendations might be, maybe first of all, these micro-credentials can be implemented at some uh, as a pilot project uh, with a group of universities, first of all, and then maybe it can be spread among other universities. And of course, in centralized systems like the one in Turkey, actors, participants always expect something from the central governments. For example, some of the participants, some governance of universities say that they already encourage their students to take at least three to five courses from some trustworthy providers like edX or other international uh, platforms. But the problem is students do not want to take them because they will not be able to use them on their transcripts. Universities cannot integrate them into their transcripts. So they would like to have maybe an official paper, a regulation, or maybe a roadmap from the Central uh, Council of Higher Education to do this in a specific way, maybe. And of course, the other issue is if, you, if we tell a university, okay, you can start offering micro-credentials, it is not something that could be done overnight. So first of all, they will need some administrative support. For example, uh, they will need some experts who will assess uh, micro-credentials, uh, maybe uh, ECTS uh, equivalency, or maybe uh, there will be some other stuff uh, members to uh, maybe promote it or maybe to deal with students' answers, etc. And of course, finance is another issue. Uh, as I said before, in Turkey, uh, over 92% of uh, students are enrolled in public universities and it is for free. In the home country of micro-credentials in the North American context, university education is mostly already uh, you know, uh, sponsored by students or their fa their families, so they have to pay their traditional higher education. So uh, they also pay for their micro credentials. But we are not sure if in Turkey it, it works in this way. Uh, maybe there must be a support needed, financial support needed uh, by governments, uh, maybe central funding source as well. And as I said. Also, uh, micro-credentials is a quite new topic, so it requires some promotions as well. So thank you so much. Let me just stop sharing. Thanks, Hakan. Um, I want to thank both speakers um, for giving us such a, a good outline of this top, important topic. And I mean, many people are interested in this topic as judging by the participation in this webinar and also by the 13 comments in the chat. Um, I must apologize to everyone though, because I don't think we're going to have time for an adequate discussion on the basis of what people are raising, uh, because we do close just after uh, 3 p.m. UK time. But um, let me bring in uh, three people. Uh, and if we've got time, we'll have a quick response from our one or both of our speakers. Um, I'm afraid a lot of people will miss out uh, but the three people I, I have on my list are um, Sharon Ulsch, who came in early and has been making a number of comments in the chat, Kayla Martin from uh, UNESCO, and Shizuka Kato from OECD. So can we please have uh, Sharon first? Sure. Thanks, Simon. Um, I'll be brief. I really, I'm really thinking about micro-credentials as how it might disrupt the status quo. And here I'm thinking, you know, credit is really attached to time, seat time. It's attached to finances. And I see the potential that micro-credits really could disrupt and transform higher ed. And I'd be curious to know what the speakers think or others. Thanks, Sharon. Uh, Michaela. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh... Um, for uh, giving me the floor. Um, I think um, uh, we see micro-credentials uh, coming up as a very important topic, I think because of many reasons. 
uh, but also because I think of the importance that both national governments and, and international organizations are giving, uh, are giving to the topic. And I think with the hope that micro-credentials provide a, uh, an important mechanism for workers upskilling and reskilling. And um, so uh, maybe also to refer to the to the work of the of the European Union and uh, two recent um, council recommendations that have been prepared by um, the European Commission uh, for adoption by the, the member states. And I think the, the point that these recommendations, uh, this is the first on micro credential stresses, is really the need to adopt a common definition and standard elements for their description. And I think we have seen that the difficulty actually with defining precisely what, what they are, what they are not, and the related procedures for uh, quality assurance and recognition. So I think this is really the, the avenue to, to bring uh, micro-credentials, I think, to, um, to, uh, to, a stronger, to a stronger position in, in the higher education systems. And my question is really, um, this is related to a second council recommendation, which is concerning individual learning accounts, because I think the, um, the, the provision of funding for, for micro-credentials beyond individual uh, funding is really important. And the role that can be played by individual learning accounts. So the recommendation uh, is really that countries set up uh, funding mechanisms, which provide opportunities I mean, regular opportunities for workers uh, via these individual learning accounts to access training provisions. And what you see, whether you see this as a, as a strong avenue to, to fund uh, micro-credentials. So I stop here. Thanks, Mikhail. There's a clear question there. And can we bring in uh, Shizuka at this point? Um, yes. So shall I, I guess I'll leave the question to the presenters. And I'll just make a short uh, comment um, about looking at, mm -hmm. thank you very much for the presentations and also thank you for referring to our work. Uh, we do work on micro-credentials uh, for around two years and will be, we will be following the topic in the coming years. So it's very useful to learn from you and uh, maybe just answer one question because we don't have much time, but um, a few people asked the, a difference between Micro credentials and the certi certificates. And mm -hmm. uh, in our understanding, we see certificates belong to the kind of umbrella of micro credentials because micro credentials is just a new name for these like short learning programs, as John already mentioned. And uh, we, um, OECD, UNESCO, and the European Commission, um, many, many governments, we each have definitions, but the, all of the definition basically cover um existing certificate programs so yes that's what i understand thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak thanks shishuka so um colleagues you have two questions there one from sharon and, and not the other from michaela sharon was about the disruptive potential of micro credentials and, and michaela was asking about funding structure john and uh and hakan would you like to respond and i think this will, this will close the webinar john please go first I think you are muted. John, we haven't heard you yet, so you may have to turn your mic on. No, I was going to say a quick response to, um, to Sharon about, um, and, and it's really a response with another question. Um, will micro-credentials be disruptive? Um, I think my question is quite possibly, and then the question would be, would that be a good thing? Do we want some disruption? And I would just link that to some of the broader literature about higher education, um, which I often remember the concepts of universities can be troublesome institutions. Maybe micro-credentials will be troublesome credentials as well. And then the question is, do we want that? I can. Yeah, I think I agree with John. Uh, it is quite, I think, early to say if it disrupts higher education or not. 
but we see that uh, from our participants and also from some other reports uh, we have been reviewing, we see that uh, micro credentials might maybe uh, start a new wave of uh, providing higher education because uh, we see that even in uh, some international students uh, expectations we see uh, they might sometimes prefer the shorter and more packaged programs and more specific programs so micro credentials can be uh, can meet these expectations in the future so we are gonna see so if you ask me i am maybe 50 percent and 50 percent but as i said i think it might be a, a new wave in higher education we are gonna see yeah, I think those questions are really interesting, aren't they? I mean, the um, potential of, uh, of micro-credentials expands once you get a high level of employer recognition. Mm -hmm. It also expands when um, you we start to more systematically collect micro-credentials into a larger portfolio of, 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 um, of micro-qualifications so that people can assemble you know, a, a comprehensive set of, uh, of training through micro-credentialing. Once we're doing that kind of thing, and once we have employer recognition, then we start to break the nexus between the traditional providers and the, the uh, tertiary education process. And when that happens, a lot of things change because at the, pr at the present time, the accountability structure of higher education works through institutional identity. And a lot of the status of higher education, at least in the top third or so of institutions, is attached to institutional identity. So this throws the emphasis more on learning content and perhaps skill and, and their use, a bit less on status and less on institution, but governments that run higher education as a market are running it as a market of providers, of, yeah. of, of institutions like companies in the marketplace. And if that's not the structure anymore, then we really are in a different universe. Um, so I think you've opened us up to that whole discussion. We see these things are ha now happening um, the potential for change is, is high, but I must say the resilience of, of the traditional system, don't underestimate it. It's yeah. profound. It's very strong, especially when there's so much status attached to, as I said, the top third or so of institutions, that, that core structure, and with others wanting to imitate that structure to, to get some of that status create, creating power is yeah. very, very strong. So I think that that's the point of resistance. And it was with MOOCs as well. You know, MOOCs, MOOCs in the end, were um, adapted by the institutions rather than uh, uh, rivaling, rivaling the institutions. And one reason was that the employers, of course, have never given them um, much, much credibility in terms of an alternative. And so that's probably the key here. If the employers like micro-credentials and that works, then it's a new ball game. I think everything else will start to follow. Um, okay, folks, thanks very much for participating. Apologies to Tim Wilmer Solomon, Diana, Ali, David, Tasneem, and Romina. Um, we would have liked to have put you on camera and perhaps next time we can. Um, our next webinar, which is being held this week on Thursday, is the first of our four-part series on higher education and knowledge in Latin America. And the first uh, uh, paper will be presented by Martin Benavides from uh, Peru, former Minister of Higher Education in Peru, who will talk about the political economy of higher education reform in Latin America. It's a really strong webinar series, this four part series, really uh, invite you to, to, to you know, um, and urge you, to, urge you to, to, to tune in. I think it'll be, you'll learn a lot about Latin America. If you're not from Latin America, if you are from Latin America, it'll be a good discussion, I think. Um, look forward to seeing everyone next time. Thanks once again to Harkin and, and to John for your excellent presentations, very informative today. We, we, we'd love to see you back at some stage to tell us how um, micro-credentials are going in future. Sure. Bye for now. Thank you so much. Bye.